Good morning, everyone, and welcome to English Worship. What a joy and a privilege it is to worship together with you this morning.、Uh, even though we may be apart physically, that doesn't stop us from worshiping our God together.、Um, and to kind of prepare us for that, I'd like to read a passage from Romans. So in chapter 11, verse 33, Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how ins- inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And he continues in chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect.、Uh, so, with these verses in mind, let's, let's pray.、Uh, Father, we just thank you again for just another day where we can、um, just reflect on your grace and your goodness and your works and character.、Um, Lord, this passage just speaks so much truth to us.、Um, truly, No one has been your counselor. You are inscrutable.、Um, you're unsearchable. But that's what makes you God. And、um, Lord, we know that you have created everything through Jesus and to Jesus. And it's because of his sacrifice on the cross, which we remembered last week, but even continue to remember today,、um, that we have life and that we can do anything. And Lord, I just ask that you help us to respond by treating our bodies as a living sacrifice.、Uh, I pray, Lord, that we would、um, consider and just seek to understand what that means for each one of us.、Um, help us, Lord, to be guarded from conforming to the world, but to be transformed by the renewal of our minds.、Um, help us to develop good habits that、um, can help us with that.、Um, And Lord, we just recognize that we can't do this on our own power, but as the passage says, it requires your mercy. It requires your spirit and your work in our lives. And so we entrust them to you. And、um, yeah, we're just thankful for what you've done for us. And that's all the reason why we will sing these songs to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, would you join me in singing to our Lord?
Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just thank you so much again for this morning. Um, we thank you for sending us your son um, to die on the cross for, for the punishment of our sins. And then on the third day to rise again and to prove that he has conquered death, he has conquered sin, and showing that we as well will one day conquer death and conquer sin um, to be with you in heaven forever. Uh, Lord, we just take this morning to lift up the churches in the Bay Area and, and even around the world. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for um, just their ministries and continuing to serve you um, and reach out to their church members and as well as uh, non-believers, even though, even in these uh, uncertain times. And we just pray for their ministries. We ask that um, your spirit would be with them, that you would give them success. Um, uh, and that even though we are apart physically, um, but again, your spirit uh, still um, is, exists within us and is uniting us together as one body of believers. And so uh, we just ask that you still be moving um, in ways that even we can't understand throughout the Bay Area, and that you would use your church and the local churches in the Bay Area to, um, to reach those who need to hear your gospel or need um, the word of hope and truth and love uh, that your gospel is. And um, we just ask that if there's opportunities for our church to partner with those churches, um, that, yeah, you would help us to um, uh, seek those out and to uh, take advantage of them. And now as we um, turn to your word, and I just pray that uh, you'd be working in our hearts to give us a teachable spirit, um, a humble spirit, and um, also give us the clarity of mind to um, uh, just perceive what you have to teach us uh, this morning through Pastor Bruce. And uh, so we just thank you so much again for this time we can worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's great to see everybody. Great to know that we're all worshiping God together. And looking forward to a time when we can see each other in person, but until then, we will continue to do it virtually. Anyway, let's get on with our message here. You know, when someone asks you, can we talk? You know that they have something very deep and very serious to say. And that's where we are in our sermon series on integrating faith with life. Thus far, we have talked about the general concepts, important concepts, but the general concepts of being rooted in God's word, of understanding our identity in Christ, of being able to take worries and overcome them through our faith, and also being fully committed to Christ. Now we're getting into the can we talk time. The next several messages will take us into integrating our faith with how we manage our bodies and relationships with how we manage our time, how we manage our money, how we manage our family, how we manage our politics, and how we manage our work. And we may add another topic or two in there too. But this is where the rubber meets the road. God's word says that our loves must reflect our beliefs and our commitment. If our walk does not match our talk, then something is seriously wrong. Just like it says in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. When we are that way, then we're either ignorant of God's commands or we are just flat out disobedient to God's commands. Neither option is good because we give the world less reason to trust us and less reason to trust God. Nobody likes people who do not deliver on their promises or do not live according to their stated beliefs. Today, we'll be looking at integrating our faith with biblical sexual morality. Now that I have your attention because I said the word sex, let's briefly define it and we'll expand on it as the message goes along. Biblical sexual morality is sex the way that God designed it and how he wants us to use it. Sex is more than a physical or emotional act. It represents a spiritual union a closeness between husband and wife, and there's also a picture of the union between Christ and the church. 
One author used the acronym PLUM to describe the purposes of sex. PLUM, P-L-U-M, P is for pleasure, L is for love, U is for unity, M is for multiplying. It's an understatement to say that sex drives our culture. Look all around you, look in the news and entertainment, the arts, fashion, politics, crime, just to name a few. So much centers around sex or involves sex one way or another. Many movements are afoot right now to decriminalize and to normalize various questionable sexual behaviors. Now, Jesus is Lord of our lives, then that includes how we think about and how we live as sexual beings. Sex is more than what you get taught in school. It's more than what you see on the screen. It's more than how you express your love or desire for someone, and it's also more than how you think about yourself. Sex, just like every aspect of our identity, begins with how God sees you. And God sees us as dearly beloved. He also sees us as clearly lost due to our inherent sin nature. This sin distorts our thinking. It distorts our actions and our attitudes. But he desires to restore us through Jesus' death on the cross and from the rising on the dead. As we receive Jesus into our heart, the Holy Spirit then moves into us, filling us, cleansing us, and reshaping us into the Father's image. He entrusts us with his mission, that is, to share the good news with the rest of the world. From this, we face the challenge of living in the world and yet not letting the world live in us. But we're not alone. God's people have always struggled to live godly lives, whether today or even 2,000 years ago in an ancient city called Corinth. Corinth was very known for its uh, wealth, its commerce, and for the arts. It could have been like San Jose today. The Apostle Paul was able to plant a church there, but it struggled under the cultural influences of the day, much like how we Christians struggle under today's culture. With that in mind, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. It begins, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, excuse me, God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who joined, is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, of whom, uh, you, of whom you are from God? You are not your own, but you are bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. Paul again begins by citing two attitudes about sex. And these attitudes were prevalent at that time. And you'll see that they're very similar to our modern views of sex as well. Even though the Corinthian church was nearly 2,000 years ago, life is still quite similar. The world has changed dramatically over time. Our hearts have not. The first common attitude that he cited is in verse 12. All things are lawful for me. Today we say things like, hey, it's legal, deal with it. Or it's okay, everyone's doing it. Or no one's getting hurt. Sound familiar? Different times, different cultures, same attitudes. This is why the Bible is still relevant today. It teaches, it tackles, excuse me, tackles the timeless issues of mankind. 
even though the environment changes, the times changes, and the place changes, people's attitudes remain the same. There are at least three things wrong with this, this belief that just because it's legal, it's good for me. First off, God's definition of what is, I mean, it's not God's definition, our definitions of what is right and wrong, or what is legal and illegal, changes. Youth, ask your parents how they disciplined you. I mean, you know how your parents disciplined you, but ask your parents how they were disciplined when they were your age. And if you're able, ask some of your aunts and uncles or ask your grandparents, how were they disciplined? You'd be surprised how much has changed over the last 50 to 60 years. When I was growing up, parents never said to their kids, okay, time out for you. And for me, my father slapped me when I lied to him. My mother, frankly, was a ruler for playing soccer in the house. And my grandfather used to call me good for nothing. He called me that more often than he called me by name. So maybe as far as he was concerned, good for nothing was my name. That's the way it was back then. We grew up with it. We dealt with it. And that was that. Do you do any of those things today? That's child abuse. The same thing about sex. What was illegal before is becoming legal now. That's what you see with abortion. That's what you see with the definition of marriage. That's what you see with gay rights. So the definitions change. Paul gives two more responses to this, everything was lawful for me, my attitude here. He says, but not all things are helpful. A lot of things are legal and permissible, but not everything is good for you. It may be legal to smoke and to drink, especially if you're of age, but we all know the damage that they do to your body. In the same way, many sexual activities may be legal, but we pay big prices later on. We pay physically with anything from unwanted pregnancy to sexually transmitted diseases. Some of those diseases, by the way, are incurable. You know, when you sleep with someone outside of marriage, you're sleeping with every person that that person has ever slept with in his past, and vice versa. That's the definition of STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. We pay an emotional price too. Many people, after they've had sex with somebody, especially for the first time, they feel misused or abused or, or cheapened. Spiritually, we pay a price because our sins separate us from God. We were doing some premarital counseling with this couple one time, and they shared with us how they had been having sex before marriage. We presented some scriptures to them and asked them to think about it, and then they came back in the next session, and they said they decided to stop. I asked them, what made you stop thinking it was something that I said, or maybe they liked the way I, I put some responses together or anything like that, but they came up with a far better response than what I was thinking of. The guy told me, I was picturing Jesus standing in our bedroom, watching us with tears in his eyes. And with that for him, it was enough for him to stop. Our world tells us, you do whatever you want to do, but Christians are to do whatever God told them to do. That's why Christians shouldn't settle for being legal. We should strive for being godly. The law of the land is not our highest standard. Our highest standard is the Bible. Our Declaration of Independence grants everyone the inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness. But God's word calls us to live in the pursuit of holiness. There's a second uh, reply from Paul about all things in off of me is not the way to go. He says, I will not be dominated by anything. You might have heard of a 12-step group called Alcoholics Anonymous. Did you know it was started by two Christians who were struggling with alcoholism? One was a doctor and he was losing his, his practice over his alcoholism. Even though drinking was legal back then as it is now, these men struggled with it and became enslaved to it, just like so many others are struggling and enslaved to alcohol today. As it relates to today's message, pornography is so addicting and so prevalent um, among all ages and both genders as well. It too is addicting. Many years ago, pornography was only found in the magazine rack of a drugstore or 
in an adult-only bookstore. People often looked around to make sure that nobody could see them for fear of being exposed or you know, uh, being caught. Nowadays, you can find pornography anywhere you want at any time you want. You can find it on your phone while you're in your bedroom. You can find it in your den at your, at your computer or in the living room in your TV. You can find it on your laptop while you're out on the go. It's accessible no matter how old or how young you are. These people don't ask for proof of age. And you don't have to go out looking for those pictures. They find you. These images can stay in your mind for years, coming back up to, my, you know, to the front of your memory at the most inopportune times. And then as you transfer those images onto real people, you cheapen them by treating them as sex objects instead of looking them at them as real people. And as try as hard as you may, is a huge struggle to rid your mind of these pictures. Thankfully, God gives us ways to clean our minds and to fill them with the right things through passages like Philippians 4, verses 6 to 8. And here's verse 8, which is the main part of it. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Don't just try to empty your minds of bad thoughts. Fill them with the right thoughts, the good thoughts. We we'll also find the second common attitude about sex here in verse 13. It says food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. Just as hunger is a natural drive and a natural appetite, they figure, well, so is sex. And therefore, the implication is if I can go to different restaurants to eat, then why can't I go to different beds to have sex? In addition to that, many people say, if sex is natural, then stop laying a guilt trip on me. This is who I am, and this is who I need to be. Paul answers these attitudes with the rest of the verses in today's passage. But keep in mind as you read this passage, especially when you read it uh, through, that you see two terms that are mentioned, sexual immorality and prostitution. And so if you only see those two terms, it's, a, it's very easy to want to equate the two. Prostitution is sexual immorality, and therefore sexual immorality is prostitution. But when you look at the scripture as a whole, you see that sexual immorality is far broader than that. It includes such things as rape, as incest, adultery, homosexuality, lust, and more. So when you see sexual immorality, think of it in its broader meaning, not just in the immediate context. The center of Paul's response is found in two verses. Verse 13, it says, our bodies are meant for the Lord. And then in verse 19, it says, you are not your own. Both of these verses fly in the face of our culture. It goes against everything that we stand for, that you know, our, our, our world stands for. Our Western worldview stresses the individuality and the independence of each person. You hear statements like, this is my body, this is my life, don't you tell me what I can and cannot do. In 1875, a poet named William Henley, Henley penned these words. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. We see that sentiment in the pro-choice movement and the gender identity movement. And these are natural outgrowths of this push for individuality. But God never intended to be politically correct. He is more concerned about our holiness, that is, being conformed to his image. And he is being concerned about our happiness, which is us being conformed to our own self-images. So while the world pushes us to have pride and be independent, God calls us to be humble and to be dependent upon him. As Christians, our lives should center around him, and not ourselves, not our families, not our cultures, and not our world. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. 
Now, God has very high standards, and he makes no apology for that. In John chapter 6, Jesus challenged his many followers about his identity. In verse 60, we read, when many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Then we read in verse 66, after many of his disciples, or after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So expect to be different from the world. This is how you will know that you belong to Christ. We have to be like the Israelites in Joshua 24, verse 15, when he told them to choose this day whom you will serve. As one sign said, what is right is not always popular, and what is popular is not always right. When Jesus died for our sins, he set us free from Satan's grips. He paid the price for our freedoms. We are no longer slaves to sin, but now we are slaves to righteousness. God bought us, so he now owns us. And this is the message that we receive in verse 20. It says, you were bought with a price. So with God being our master, or we call him Lord, then we are to do his will, and no longer Satan's will, nor even our own will. Therefore, we are to glorify God with our body, just as we glorify him through the way that we live, through the kind of friend that we are to others, by the grace and forgiveness that we show to those who hurt us, and by the patience and love that we are to show to those who even hate us. In the context of this message, we are to glorify God through our sexual purity, by the ways that we treat others, and even by the ways that we think about them. Paul described God's plan for sex in verses 15, 16 and 17, and then verse 19. Let's start with verses 16 and 17. It says here, for it is written, for the two will become flesh, one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Here we see that marriage reflects our spiritual relationship with God. This is because verse 16 quotes, uh, we see the quote, the two shall become one flesh. This came from uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25, when God created marriage. There God placed a man in the garden to work and then declared that um, it was not good for man to be alone. So he created woman as a, as a helper for man, a helper fit for the man. And when we read that, we're tempted to think that that meant that the woman was to be his slave or his servant. But that's not what the scripture says. Even the man acknowledged that she came from his side, you know, near to his heart. And he said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Meaning that she was as much a part of him as he was of her. So she was his equal, not his lesser. In Genesis 2, 24, this union was culminated in physically joining together and is described as the two becoming one flesh. This is the concept that Paul cited in 1 Corinthians 6, 16. Paul also mentioned the one term flesh in Ephesians 5, 31, when he wrote about the love relationship between a husband and wife. We see that a love relationship a one flesh relationship, excuse me, is a very close, intimate, and complete joining of two lives. It's far more than a physical union, it's an intimate spiritual union as well. And it, it is that way because it's also a picture of God's love for his people. Now, as we place our marriage, and that's for those of us who are married, alongside our relationship with God, one parallel that jumps out between the two is the expected devotion of one to the other. Just as in the Ten Commandments we're told that we shall put no other gods before God, in our marriage, we know that we should not put any other person before our spouse. This means no pornography, no wandering eyes, no dreaming of others, no flirting with other people, no inappropriate touching, and no adultery. Be aware of inappropriate situations, such as one-on-one -on -one marital counseling or traveling with someone of the opposite gender. Be 
be aware how easy it is to cross your limits. From the testimonies of pastors who have fallen, who've had moral failures and lost their ministries, I was reading on some of these things here, we learned that none of them woke up some morning and said, oh, I think I'll have an affair today. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen by choice. These failures begin rather innocently. Maybe the pastor had a bad morning. Maybe he had a bad time with his wife and he's gone to the church feeling a little bit depressed or um, exhausted or tired, uh, whatever. And he, he finds another woman over there and he starts talking to her and he finds out that this woman understands her, him better than his wife did. Or maybe a woman calls him for marital counseling and so he's listening to her and giving her some feedback. And she says, oh, you understand me so much better than my husband does. These comments, regardless of which side it comes from, it stokes his ego because it helps him to feel affirmed and validated. And then these counseling these sessions become more common. And before anyone realizes it, the two become emotionally attached. And then sexual involvement is not too much further behind. The husbands, wives, honor each other. It's easy to point out others' faults in public and to embarrass them. And some people seem to enjoy it because that's the way they do it on TV, especially in a lot of these comedy shows. You know, if you need to seek guidance and support for the problem in your relationship, then ask the right people and do it with the intent of building up your marriage, not with the intent of tearing down your partner. Ask what you can do to make things better, not just what can your spouse do to make things better. Be aware of how many details you share and with whom. And whether you're married or not, so that's all of us here, remember and honor the image of God that is in everyone around you. They're not there for you to selfishly touch or even dream about. Stay away from the things that will cause you or others to stumble. Learn how to capture every thought for Christ, as it says in 2 Corinthians 10.5. And we see something that is visually enticing to you. Learn to bounce your eyes away as soon as you become aware of that. You may not be able to control who walks into your field of view, but you can control how long you look. Remember what Martin Luther once said. You cannot prevent the birds from landing on your head, but you can keep them from building a nest. Now, if you're watching pornography, do whatever it takes to get out of it. Discover what led you into it in the first place. Are you watching it for social acceptance because others are doing it and you don't want to be left out? Maybe it's time to find some new friends. Are you watching it because of the thrill of getting away with something of feeling powerful that you can fool others, know that God is watching you and he's not laughing. Maybe you're watching pornography because you're unhappy with your own relationship. Fix yourself, fix your relationship, and you won't need the pornography. Finally, if you're watching pornography because you're lonely, come and meet the God who loves you so much that he'll take you just as you are and he loves you too much to leave you as you are. But regardless of the reason, God gives you his Holy Spirit to, break, uh, to be able to break free from it. Speak to each other respectfully. Don't make disparaging remarks or jokes about one another's bodies. And speaking of jokes, stay away from off-color jokes or open discussions about one's sexual life. And for those of you who are in a dating relationship, honor God and each other by saving yourselves for marriage. Hebrews 13.4 says, let the marriage bed be held in honor by all and let the marriage uh, be undefiled. Set agreed upon boundaries as to what the two of you will do when you are by yourselves. Commit to helping each other to stay within God's plan, not tempting each other to your own desires. Pray that God would give you a foresight to know when you're nearing some compromising situations and when you do, 
that he would enable you to uh, to have power over your hormones and that he would give you the strength and the wisdom to run like Joseph as he did from Potiphar's wife when she tried to make moves on him. Try group dating. Begin and end your dates with prayer. Have accountability partners, people you can call on for help for prayer. We have two more verses to go. Verse 15 says, you are members of Christ's body. That means where you go, he goes. What you do, he will see. What you say, he will hear. What you think, he will know. The short admonition here is that don't take Jesus where he would not want to go or to do things that you would not want for him to watch. Finally, in verse 19, it says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, a building represents the one who lives in it. When you tell people to come to your house, you give them your address, and you also tell them, oh, it's the green one with the brown trim, or it's the one with the fire hydrant in front, the one with the tree on the lawn. Then when people see the landmarks, they think of you. You don't need the address anymore. That building represents you. When God lives inside you, your body becomes his temple. And when people see you, they should think of God. In real estate, they say houses should have something called a curb appeal. They should speak to prospective buyers and draw them in. Now, as a temple of the Holy Spirit, what is your curb appeal? In other words, how does your life reflect the goodness and the power of God? I'll close this message with a charge and then a comfort. The charge to you is verse 21. Glorify God with your body. Use sex in ways that glorify God. That's what he created you for. Not for your own gratification, but for his glory. I also want to give you a comfort. Because it goes without saying that none of us are perfect. We all fail in one way or another. We may feel that we've crossed the line with God and there is no more hope for us. We live under a cloud of shame or a cloud of fear of being caught and exposed. If you are burdened about something that you've done in the past or maybe some things that you're still doing, or if you're burdened about some ways that you've felt in the past or some ways that you're feeling now, I want to share with you three truths from some verses that precede today's passage. These verses are from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but verses 9 through 11. Now to share some observations about them. First, let's look at verses 9 and 10. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The first observation is there are nine sins that are listed in these two verses here. Three of them are sexual sins. Six of them are not. The lesson from these is that all of our sins and each of our sins separate us from God. We may react to some sins stronger than others, and we may try to rationalize some sins more so than others. But the message of these two verses is very clear. Our sins separate us from God. It doesn't matter how big or how small, but the fact that we sin separates us from him. Observation number two is that if you take just these two verses by themselves, that can be quite depressing because it makes you wonder how long ago did we cross that line with God? When have we worn out his patience? And when do we stop qualified being called his child? But as they say in infomercials, wait, there's more. Here are the same verses again, but this time I'll add verse 11 to it. So, so do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Verse 11 is the key for all of us. God's grace is greater than all of our sin. It's because of his grace that we can have a new life in Christ. Remember, such were some of you. So we praise God for that. <clears throat> we praise God for not only a holy God, but a loving God. And because of that love and the way that he has set us free from sin, we can be holy people and that we can be holy temples for him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of sex. Father, we ask for your forgiveness for the times and the ways that we have misused it, we have abused it. Whether it's to satisfy ourselves, whether it's to get something from somebody else, to manipulate things from other people, maybe get even, whatever, Lord. We want to confess all of those to you. We pray that you would restore us and renew us. Lord, I pray for those who are married in our congregation. Lord, we pray that you build those marriages up. Strengthen them, Lord. Give them your love for each other. Lord, give them patience. Give them grace. Lord, I pray for those who are dating or engaged. Lord, I ask you to guide them as they seek these next steps. Lord, help them to honor each other and to honor marriage and to honor you their behavior. Lord, I pray for those who are looking forward to getting married someday. Maybe right now they're not attached to anybody. Maybe they're still looking for that right person. Lord, regardless of whatever their setting is, Lord, we pray for them and pray that you would hear their cries, hear their tears, Lord. Carry them and let them know that you hear them, you understand, and that you will answer them, Lord, in your good timing. Lord, may you fill them with yourself. Lord, pray for those who maybe are not dating and you don't even care. Lord, we pray that you will guide them and help them to be able to become people who are ready or are growing in you, Lord, who honor you, not knowing that they are making themselves even more qualified to be, uh, to be married, to be in relationships, Lord. Fill them up, Lord. And let's, you know, we look forward to seeing how you're going to use them. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.